The year is 2000 BC, a pivotal moment in human history, marking the middle of the Bronze Age, a time when civilizations across the globe are on the cusp of monumental changes, teetering in between the advent of written language and classical antiquity. There's plenty to witness, from the flourishing metropolises of the Fertile Crescent to the warlike migrating stepwalk the architectural ingenuity of the Indus Valley and the nascent dynasties along the Wei River in China. But what of Africa? The people of this vast continent, so often overlooked in historical narratives, were experiencing their own legend play out, distinct from the famous storylines of Egypt. Africa, with its immense size and diverse landscapes, defies any attempt to encapsulate its history into a single narrative. Much like Asia, its histories unfold across various regions, each defined by its unique blend of culture, genetics and interactions. The history of Africa can be compartmentalised into five, sometimes six, distinct regions. Atlantic Africa, North Africa, Northeast Africa, Southeast Africa, and South and Central Africa. This region, now home to the most populous country on the continent and the ancestral homeland of the black populations of the New World, holds a profound significance in the annals of Western history. At the twilight end of the third millennium BC, it shared few similarities with its modern counterpart. Instead, a realm utterly distinct from the Atlantic Africa of today. In the northern reaches of this vast region, specifically the Savannah and Sahel regions, the primary means of subsistence were farming and pastoralism, mirroring the present day. Remarkably, yams had already been domesticated in this region three millennia prior and are still a staple food in this area today, but this is where the similarities end. In the Sahel, the ancient Tichit culture of Mauritania was in its infancy. Established by the forebears of the Soninke and related groups, they practiced a mix of agro-pastoralism, herding sheep and cultivating pearl millet. In the years to come, they would leave their indelible mark on this landscape by constructing the region's earliest examples of monumental architecture. Venturing further south into the lush forested realms of Atlantic Africa. The terrain, the lifestyle and the inhabitants took on an entirely different character. In what is now home to millions of Niger-Congo speaking, crop-reliant communities in Cameroon and the Ivory Coast, one would encounter bands of diminutive hunter-gatherer populations, incredibly divergent in phylogeny and lifestyle to the extant populations of these countries. These groups would likely have shared genetic ties with the Central African forager populations, many of whom would soon be absorbed by migrating agricultural communities from further north, marking a significant juncture that many posit as the beginning of the initial wave of the Great Bantu migration. In the year 2000 BC, North Africa was a region defined by innovation and trade exemplified best by the cities of ancient Egypt. As the Middle Kingdom dawned in Egypt after a tumultuous century known as the First Intermediate Period, the rest of North Africa had its own unique stories to tell. It is said that environments define cultures, and at this time, a most profound environmental change was underway with the complete desertification of the previously green Sahara. This transformation had a great impact on the region's inhabitants particularly the nomadic herding groups of the interior. In response, many migrated to adjacent fertile river valleys, while others ventured northward to coastal areas. Near the Mediterranean coast, where more temperate conditions prevailed, agriculture flourished. It was during this period that the Belbika culture, an Iberian export, characterized by its extinctive inverted bell-shaped drinking vessels, entered North Africa. Communities of farmers thrived and the region exhibited the early signs of state building. Speakers of likely an Amazigh language 
an Arabic speaking North African of today would likely recognize phonetic similarities but wouldn't be able to communicate effectively. While genetic influences from European and West African people would eventually affect these populations through events like, but not restricted to, the Trans-Saharan and Barbary slave trades, modern North Africans still would derive a significant proportion of their ancestry from these late Neolithic farmers and even earlier North Africans. You'd find this to be a region defined by contrast, with the emerald highlands of the Horn stretched to meet the unforgiving desert lowlands of Sudan, and where chaos defined pastoralism coexists and thrives with the orderliness of the former states of sub Saharan Africa. Like in the north and the west, you'd be met by farmers and herders alike. An important distinction here is that rather than sheep or goats, cattle were the preferred life source for the herdsmen of the Eastern Sahara. The mighty Nile River, much like in Egypt to the north, defined the landscape here, with cities flourishing all along its length, especially in Nubia, where four fledged kingdoms were taking root. Nubia, home to the Sea route culture, the Kerma culture, and the subsequent Kingdom of Kerma, thrived with urban centres and a stratified society that stood on par with other Bronze Age civilizations. To the east, along the harsh expanses of the eastern desert, you'd encounter the Pangrave and Gash group cultures, with Gash likely the enigmatic land of Punt mentioned in early Egyptian records. These were the primary cattle herders of the region, renowned for their hardiness and martial prowess. West of the Nile, another robust cattle herding people existed, and although they shared the occupation of herding, their phylogenetic background differed significantly. It is thought that before the Yellow Nile's desiccation, this westerly group would often launch expeditions into Nubia and Egypt. Along the Nile River in 2000 BC, you'd encounter populations akin to modern Sudanese Arab and Nubian populations. This phenotypical continuity is reflected in the craniometric, dental and genomic records, best shown by a study on a Nubian man from Kajurika 4,000 years ago, showing the greater similarity to Kushitic groups of the Horn who, in turn, are very closely related to the aforementioned Sudanese groups. The Beja, residing in the same desert hills and plains as their Pangrave and Medjay ancestors did over 4,000 years ago, offer a remarkable testament to the continuity in this region. West of the Nile, the pattern continues, as Sudanic groups like the Zagawa are also likely connected to the rugged tribes on the western periphery all those years ago. The languages spoken here were split between two still persisting sub-branches of Nilo Saharan and Afro-Asiatic, Eastern Sudanic and Cushitic languages respectively. In Lower Nubia and the Eastern Desert, it seems Cushitic languages were spoken, but in Upper Nubia and the Western Desert, Eastern Sudanic tongues dominated. Advanced southerly into the Horn and you'd encounter many surprises. In the hinterlands of the Ethiopian Highlands, Today inhabited by Semitic speaking people of predominantly Cushitic origin, roamed Omotic groups now isolated to the southwestern reaches of Ethiopia, along with, potentially, speakers of a language with a click consonant similar to the outlying Hadza and Kwisan languages. Shift your gaze now to southeastern Africa, a land of interior and coastal allure. The tribes that to us seem like timeless constituents in the plains of East Africa like the jumpy Maasai, had yet to experience their own ethnogenesis. Instead, you find southeastern Africa, inhabited by shepherds and many isolated hunter-gatherer groups, coexisting with very little interaction. The pastoralists of this era had travelled south from Sudan relatively recently on a quest seeking new grazing lands for their sheep. And as they traversed the fertile hills, valleys and lakes of southeastern Africa, they would experience very little resistance in the way of humans. Thriving on the abundance of the Great Lakes grasslands, they developed a profound spiritual connection with the land, evident in their practice of burying their dead in expansive stone pillar sites that endured for millennia. Conversely, the same lands also played host to a myriad of Stone Age hunter-gatherer populations, antecedents of the prolific baboon hunters of Tanzania, the Hadzabe. Without the regulations placed on hunting wildlife in the 21st century, in place of hunting baboons, they would have sought out larger game like giraffe and rhinos for meats and hides. Instead of the Bantu languages that now dominate the area, you'd be met by languages related to the harsh sounding Iraqi or the unique click consonants of the Hadzabe language. 
a relic of archaic human communication that would survive in only a handful of languages. In the heartlands of Africa, Central African hunter-gatherers, kin to the earlier mentioned West African hunter-gatherers, were proposedly the sole inhabitants. These ancient peoples likely would have spoken a language that has since faded into complete obscurity and would have made the dense forests of the Congo and the riverbeds of the Congo Basin their hunting ground, employing ingenious age-old strategies and technologies to eke out sustenance in a region notoriously low in calorie-rich resources. In southern Africa, from the arid expanses of the Kalahari to the plains of Zambia, you'd run into Khoi and San-related groups. These communities with a history in this region so deep that it's quite frankly impossible to comprehend practiced the oldest hunting strategy known to humanity. Persistence hunting, which involves tracking prey over long distances until it is physically exhausted, was a hallmark of their way of life, as they'd hunt game like zebra and antelopes for up to eight hours at a time.